Thank you very much. It's uh, really a privilege to uh, ask uh, our first uh, speaker for the keynote speaker uh, and for lecture. She is a great specialist in immunology. She is uh, well known in allergy, but in immunology in general. Virginia Calder will talk uh, about the T cell subsets in ocular surface inflammation, inflammatory disease. Uh, and thank you uh, for organizing this meeting today. Um, it's lovely to see everybody face to face. I was in my bedroom when that photograph was taken last time and I am so glad to be back out in the, the big wide world. Okay, so we don't have the slides up on the main screen yet. Ah, we do. Okay, so in the program, it said uh, T-cell subsets in ocular surface inflammatory disease. Uh, but to be more specific and to make you a little bit more nervous, I will be talking about subsets of T-cell subsets, okay? So just when you thought life was getting very easy, we only have a few, now we have a few more. And uh, it's, it's very relevant to the ocular surface. Uh, so when you're thinking about future drugs and targeting, uh, we need to always be aware of what's happening at the basic science level. <coughs> okay, so I don't need to remind everybody in this audience about the role of CD4 T cells in ocular surface disease. But just in case you were wondering, of course we have TH1, TH17 cells in dry eye disease. They are detected in the tissues and they are clearly playing an important role because T cells produce cytokines to involve lots of other cell types. <coughs> I'm also, because it's closest to my heart, uh, going to be talking about um, allergic eye disease, which you may not know quite so much about. Uh, but I can assure you the T cells are there. It's not a, just a straightforward allergy response involving mast cells, but it also has CD4 T cells in the most severe forms of disease. So we have uh, vernal keratoconjunctivitis and atopic keratoconjunctivitis. Both of these conditions affect people who are allergy prone. They are atopic. And so we, we have allergic responses, but also it's a disease and there are Th1, Th17 cells there. So I'll, I'll elaborate more in due course. So just when you're feeling a bit nervous, we talk about the T cell subsets and the fact that it turns out that Th17 cells present in dry eye disease are quite plastic they can respond to changes in the cytokine microenvironment. And this is a relatively old slide you see from 2015. And we know a little bit more about the pressures on these cells to switch between. So unlike your Th1 cell down at the bottom right here, it is very stable. It is uh, pathogenic. Uh, and so if you detect that in the tissues, it will be making interferon gamma, it will be upregulating class two expression on tissue resident cells involving the tissues. It's, it's a serious problem. And you see Th1 cells in a lot of autoimmune diseases. But Th17 cells are a little bit more nimble. Uh, they are gymnastic, they are athletic. They will change their roles depending on the extra pressures. They will respond to toll-like receptor activation through mycobacteria, for example. And at the ocular surface, that's quite uh, relevant. So as you can see, there's a whole communication between um, the different cytokines that they produce, IL-17 being the main one. Um, but regulatory T cells can actually drive Th17 Treg cells, so these are double positive cells, um, thanks to the secretion of IL-6 and IL-1 beta. If these 
regulatory cells, these FOXP3 anti-inflammatory cells, uh, they can drive Th17 cells through making um, IL-6. So they, they produce TAGF beta, it drives a Th17 cell. But that Th17 cell itself can also, uh, in response to TGF beta, um, uh, promote uh, FOXP3 negative cells. So they look uh, more like Th17 cells, um, but they express IL-10. So as you can see, it's getting complicated, and I'm not going to go through all of the, the details at this stage. It's still a little bit of a jigsaw puzzle, which we have to analyze very carefully and be quite uh, skeptical about the findings and the techniques used. And so hopefully you, um, as, as new scientists in the world, will look at the results but analyze them carefully for yourselves before uh, agreeing with the conclusions that the authors might want to make about them, okay? Okay, so if we go back a little bit, this is a paper from 2014, uh, a, the, the group in Boston, uh, Razor Dana's group, and they were um, beginning to use the dry eye model that was first established by uh, our, our dear leader here, Mike Stern, uh, and his colleagues at Allergan. And they decided to look at the more chronic forms of the model in mice. So they were letting the model develop um, for you know quite a long time further. Let me just open this. Okay, so as you can see at the beginning, we have um, a peak of uh, Th1 responses in blue at the top right, and that's at the early stage of disease, at the sort of uh, initial stage. But when you go into the more chronic phases, uh, you can see that the pink cells, which are the Th17 cells, they tend to predominate over a very long period of time. And so although a, if you look at the, the clinical pictures, there's a normal eye, there's the acute ver uh, phase of disease, lots of uh, fluorescein staining, but even in the, the more chronic later stages, you can still see some fluorescein, lots of Th17 cells. And uh, down at the bottom, they don't just look like Th17 cells, but they're also making their signature cytokines. So you have an increase in interferon gamma and IL-17 IL um, at, at both phases. But when you get into the chronic phase, the, um, the Th17 cells start to predominate. So they go up in relation to the interferon gamma. And these Th17 cells persist. Uh, you can look by flow cytometry in the tissues and in the draining lymph nodes. And you can see that um, even in the draining lymph nodes, we have this significant increase in IL-17 production at the chronic later phases. And these are, are really quite late. Now, this is also looking in, th remember, the aging mice. And the reason um, they were looking at older mice was because, of course, uh, in, in humans, the disease tends to be associated with age, some forms of disease, that is. And so it, it was to try and reflect um, the sort of more uh, clinically relevant uh, approaches. And again, as future scientists and drug developers, uh, we need to think about making these models as relevant to the diseases that we're looking at. So this was a very lovely study taking uh, a more um, clinical approach and looking at the later phases of disease. Looking in the tissues, it was possible to see these Th17 cells uh, in both corneal and conjunctival tissues. So clearly, they persist. They maintain that level of inflammation long term. And then more recently, uh, a lovely young Scottish boy called Will, uh, who did his PhD with Reza over in Boston uh, and is still um, in the States to this day. He, he was actually um, one of my PhD students, um, but he did his project with, 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 with Reza. He was interested in looking at these Th17 cells a bit further. So this time um, they were again looking at the aged mice 
and they saw that actually um, these mice experienced exacerbations, worsening of the dry eye disease, and those coincided with increases in memory Th17 cells. So now we have Th17 cells effector cells and we have memory Th17 cells. So we're looking at our first subset of a subset. So they were comparing uh, mice aged 12 to 14 months, which is really quite old for mice. Uh, that, that would make the mouse in its 70s, um, as opposed to uh, younger mice, the ones we would normally use in the lab, six to eight weeks old. And again, looking at uh, the, the, the clinical pattern, here we have normal, no disease, then we have the mild uh, staining, this would be more moderate staining, and then of course severe disease. And they looked at uh, desiccating environments, uh, two challenges, week one and week two, that constituted the primary challenge, and then they were kept uh, in the animal facility for uh, uh, several weeks, and then they were re-challenged with more desiccating stress. And looking down at the bottom, you can see the clinical profiles. Uh, the aged uh, mice had a worse uh, clinical profile than the younger mice. I'm more interested in what's going on with the cells because that's where I, I'm an immunologist. So I'm, I'm kind of looking what, what's happening with these T cells. And actually, if you look at the conjunctival and the draining lymph nodes, uh, again, they saw uh, an increase in the aged mice in terms of the frequency of the Th17 cells. So we can see them here. They're CD4 positive on the x-axis, IL-17 positive on the y-axis. So these are the ones we're seeing enhanced uh, over time and, and with age. And when you re-challenge, again, there's a significant increase in Th17 frequency. This could be blocked with anti-IL-15, and they have also published another study where they looked at inhibition of ROR gamma T transcription factor, which is the Th17 uh, hallmark transcription factor. And they were able to show that these memory Th17 cells were inhibited. So again, you could also reduce the dry eye disease clinical severity with the same inhibitors. So this really is telling us that these Th17, these memory Th17 cells are driving the disease. And I just want to draw your attention, there's a recent uh, review, 2021, that has been written around the role of Th17 cells at the different stages of disease. And I am not going to spend any time going through this beautiful picture. I'll let you read it if you're interested. Okay, so now let's move on to ocular allergy, another ocular surface inflammation. There are a whole range of different clinical classifications of ocular allergy, uh, going from, uh, sorry, left, where's my pointer? Left to right, we have the very mild seasonal form that some of us in this room might suffer from, a little bit of hay fever. Uh, not a lot of T cells involved at that stage. But as you head towards uh, the right with patients with AKC, uh, VKC, lots and lots of CD4 T cells in the tissues. And Several years ago, we, s we were able to summarize what we knew from the tissues, uh, showing that we, we knew there were Th2 cells. These are the typical allergy type cells. This is a mucosal site, so we would expect these cells to be there, plenty of mast cells around. But, um, you know, we were also seeing involvement of eosinophils producing uh, rantes and eotaxin and several cytokines, which explained to our mind what was going on in the tissues. Similarly, with AKC, uh, we were beginning to see quite a lot of uh, Th1 cells detected in the tissues as well, which might explain the even worsening uh, clinical severity. And when you take T cells out of the tissues and expand them, uh, we were able quite nicely to find lots of Th2 cytokines in all of the um, in both of the AKC and VKC uh, patients, IL-13, IL-5, but we were also seeing uh, the increase in interferon gamma. So there was something going on with Th1 cells in AKC. 
and this was found by several other groups. Uh, this is just an example here where they showed that uh, they could detect increases in interferon gamma uh, in T cells from uh, VKC patients when they had been e exposed further to a, a seasonal allergen. But then when we looked um, uh, in the tissues themselves, we were able to uh, find plenty of uh, IL-13, which hadn't been reported before, especially at the co uh, conjunctival epithelial layer, but also in AKC, you can see the IL-13 literally associated with uh, single cells uh, in inflamed tissues. These are all active uh, specimens. Now, uh, Mike uh, and, uh, and, and several of us actually uh, looked at uh, developing uh, an allergic mouse model uh, for conjunctivitis. And this was uh, way back now, Mike, 2005, uh, where um, it was called the multi-hit model. And basically, we took uh, short ragweed pollen, a typical allergen. We, ex uh, we ch uh, immunized the mice so that they were primed and sensitized to that antigen and then challenged the ocular surface, uh, giving the allergen as an eye drop. And sure enough, after several hits, you started to see inflammation arising. Here are some clinical images. They're a little bit blurred on the screen. Sorry about that. Um, 20 minutes after the first challenge, you see this typical mast cell response. But after the sixth challenge, uh, the eye is incredibly inflamed. You have this chemosis and, and tearing. Look how matted uh, the fur around the eye with the tearing. Um, so really quite uh, a strong inflammation. And when you look in the tissue, there were uh, nice increases in eosinophils and mast cells and um, neutrophils. And it, in fact, it turned out that with this model, it was the neutrophils that were significantly upregulated over the eosinophils. So they were clearly playing a role. Uh, by the way, neutrophils are uh, attracted into sites, and one of the cytokines that does attract them in is IL-17, produced by Th17 cells. Back in those days, we weren't thinking about Th17 cells, so we need to revisit these models in that context. We used the bulb C mice because we knew at the time that bulb C mice tended to be allergic. Uh, they tended to have Th2 responses. So we thought this would be clinically relevant to look at bulb C mice. And sure enough, we got these lovely increases in um, eosinophils and mast cells. But we could also see uh, some T cell cytokines uh, present in these, in these mice. And then we found, much to our surprise, that if you tried to induce this model in an interferon gamma knockout uh, bulb C background mouse, so we were sticking to the same genetic background, uh, they were completely resistant to uh, responding to short ragweed pollen. They didn't get uh, conjunctivitis at all. And Mike, you know, this was really exciting because this suggested that you needed interferon gamma in order for your T cells to become educated and for you to have an allergic response, ironically. Uh, there were still plenty of eosinophils and neutrophils coming in, whether, um, but, but when you had the interferon gamma knockout mice, they were considerably reduced in number. And in fact, uh, the same was true in the tissues, that these interferon gamma knockout depleted mice uh, did not have the same level of infiltration at all. There were no eosinophils or neutrophils. So clearly, uh, your, your T cells need to be uh, exposed to the full gamut of cytokines and other subsets in order for these normal immune responses to uh, occur. And in the interest of time, I'm going to move on a little bit. So we started looking at the tissues uh, in, in patients with VKC and AKC. And sure enough, we were able, as well as other groups, to detect IL-17 expression here um, in the epithelial uh, layer. We, we have some cells. Uh, this is a blood vessel here just under the epithelium. Uh, plenty of IL-17. And actually, the epithelium itself lights up with, with IL-17 because they have a lot of ex uh, receptors expressing uh, receptors for IL-17. So, of course, the IL-17 binds to the epithelium like a sponge. But when you spin the, te the tears down from patients with VKC and you look for 
TH17 cells, uh, we were able to see a very nice um, distinct population of ROR gamma T expressing cells, these are the TH17s, and TH2s, non-overlapping. So get this straight now, don't worry, uh, so far we have not seen a TH2, TH17 subset. Uh, they, they don't seem to overlap at all in our hands. IL-27 was looked at um, by Steve Flugfelder uh, and his group, Cynthia, and it appears that IL-27 is an important downregulator for the um, TH2 response. And when you deplete mice of IL-27, you saw an increase in IL-17. So clearly, um, depleting IL-27 increased the clinical severity of the disease, suggesting that IL-27 acts as a natural suppressor of um, responses in, in these mice. And uh, they looked at the, the different strains, the TH2 prone, the bulb Cs, the C57 black 6, and the knockouts. And it was actually uh, the IL-27 uh, depleted mice that had the strongest clinical severity. So you need IL-27 to keep, to moderate the, the dry eye disease. Uh, and similarly, looking at the typical TH2 cytokines, IL-4 on the top panel here, IL-5 and IL-13, uh, these were greatly increased in the knockout uh, mice. So I think we need to think of IL-27 as a way of downregulating the disease and therefore a potential uh, target for augmentation to, as an anti-inflammatory uh, treatment in these mice. Uh, and this also affected the transcription factor. So again, you can see with um, ROR gamma T, the TH17 um, marker, uh, that there was a significant increase in the uh, depleted uh, mice in the draining lymph nodes, but also in conjunctiva here. So it, it, it's really, it was throughout uh, the mouse model. On top of that, uh, these IL-27 depleted mice seemed to have um, a decrease in Th1 cells. So there's some dependency there on IL-27 for Th1 uh, responses. And uh, this is still slightly unclear as to how uh, this mechanism works. But as you can see, it's getting complicated. And IL-27 also decreases IL-10, uh, sorry, IL-27 depletion decreases IL-10. So clearly, when you have a fully IL-27 competent mice, you have more IL-10, and IL-10 is the anti-inflammatory cytokine for T cells, so it switches T cells down. So it looks as if uh, IL-27 is functioning via promoting IL-10 to downregulate a T cell response. Now, we've also got more severe models of allergic eye disease. Uh, this is one that was developed in the Danny Saban lab. Uh, we call it immune-mediated conjunctivitis because it's a little bit stronger and involves more CD4 T cells than the, uh, the pollen or allergen-driven one that I discussed earlier. In this case, we use ovalbumin as the inciting antigen, and um, we can see uh, you can score the, the eyes in response to topical challenge with the ovalbumin. And after four or five days, we're seeing significant inflammatory scores at the ocular surface, uh, mucus, tearing, redness, and uh, chemosis. The tissues, especially the, the conjunctival fornicial region, full of inflamed uh, cells. And uh, we can see uh, plenty of expression. Now, we're looking at particularly uh, for IL-9 at the moment. It's our, our new cytokine that we're interested in. And we can see a nice upregulation of IL-9 uh, in response to ovalbumin. These are conjunctival explants that we've used. Um, and in response to ovalbumin, uh, nice increases in IL-9 expressing FC receptor positive. In other words, mast cells are also producing IL-9 in response to the ovalbumin. And if you look in the tissues, you can see IL-9 is in green, tryptase is a marker of mast cells in red, lovely um, co-localization of that cytokine 
uh, with um, the IL-9, uh, with the mast cells. But in fact, you also see uh, these IL-9 positive PU1, which is the transcription factor we used for the Th9 cells. And we saw an increase in Th9 cells in response to ovalbumin at the ocular surface. Okay, so finally, this is our, our, least, our recent work that has just come out recently, where we were uh, looking. Now, for you guys that are developing new drugs, new treatments, new approaches, uh, us basic scientists back in the lab are using these drugs as tools to try and understand the pathways that are going on. You give us a drug that says, okay, this blocks X, Y, and Z. We then look to see what that drug does to our models to find out what X, Y, and Z do and contribute. So it's a completely opposite way of thinking about de developing uh, treatments. So I got in, um, uh, I was approached by a company called Akari, who have a drug called Namakapan, uh, which they claim to be anti-inflammatory. It's, it's actually a bifunctional, naturally occurring uh, um, biologic, and it happens, it was developed from uh, the uh, tick um, uh, pathways that block leukotriene B4 and C5 uh, together. And so we use this as a tool to see whether there was a contribution of LTB4 and C5 in our experimental model. So we gave the mice, uh, we always in our, in our lab, we induce the disease, we wait until the disease develops, and then we start our treatments. That's another important thing to remember. You don't see patients before they get sick, okay? So any models you're going to be working with, it's better to have the disease already working before you test your, your compound. So we um, applied the namakapan daily, topically, as eye drops. Uh, up, up to 12 days, and we harvested the tissues throughout that time, and we saw a nice uh, decrease in CD4s, decrease in clinical severity scores. It was all looking lovely, but in fact, of all the different um, cytokines and T cells we found to be affected, it was IL-9 and IL-4 in the CD4 T cells. In other words, the, the cells that were making these two cytokines were significantly reduced. And we also looked at some of our typical um, anti-inflammatories, dexamethasone, cyclosporin, and combinations, and they also um, inhibited, as, as would be expected. When we actually teased out the Th2 cells and what exactly was being um, affected, it turns out these are all the inflammatory scores. So by day seven, we're starting to see a nice decrease at the highest concentration of namakapan uh, whilst the ovalbumin challenge was going on. Uh, by day 10, um, really coming down to very, very low levels. Uh, and these are the IL-9 expressing cells here. And we saw a lovely sig uh, significant reduction in IL-9 positive cells, uh, whereas cyclosporin didn't seem to do very much to these IL-9 positive cells. Namakapan turns out to downregulate the Th2 cells that make IL-9. So not all the Th2 cells, just the ones that make IL-9. So I think we've got a new subset of Th2s, the ones that are IL-9 producing, as opposed to the ones that don't make IL-9. And later on, we also saw, at higher concentrations, uh, an effect on the Th9 cells themselves. But this IL-9 inhibitory effect was actually affecting Th2 IL-9 only. And so the whole point of my discussion today is to try and uh, emphasize the importance of looking at these CD4 T cell subsets as subsets themselves. Uh, so rather than saying all TH2s are downregulated, this was a, a proportion of the TH2s. They were GATA3 positive, PU1 positive, etc. And in human, in VKC tissues, we checked uh, for the expression of the receptors for IL-9. And in fact, we also saw um, receptors for leukotriene B4 in the tissues in active disease. So we know that potentially uh, namakapan might be relevant for treating patients with, with 
allergic eye disease. And these are the IL-9 levels in tears. Uh, this was done by uh, Stefano Bonini's group, Alessandra, um, where they were comparing healthy tear fluids with uh, VKC, uh, either uncontrolled disease or, or VKC patients on uh, anti-inflammatories where the inflammation was controlled, and you see there's a significant decrease in the IL-9 levels uh, in these patients. So IL-9 seems to correlate with the clinical severity scores. And I'm running out of time, so I'll just, this is just looking at the receptors again in the human tissue. Very important to always back up uh, your findings with human tissue where possible, human cells to make sure that it would be relevant uh, for patients. So in conclusion, uh, hopefully I've made you very nervous. Uh, I've kind of confused you completely. That's fine. Don't take for granted a Th1 cell is going to be behaving like a Th1 or a Th17 cell is necessarily all the same population. That's, that's the kind of key um, message for today's talk. And I'll just thank my uh, co-workers at UCL and those at Akari for the Namakapan work. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, uh, Virginia. I will have a few comments, and but congratulations for this very, very <laughs> interesting lecture, precisely because you raised question and yeah, yeah. modestly you explained that uh, everything is not an answer. I'm here to disturb. I'm here <laughs> to shake things up. Excellent. Is there uh, any question about this presentation? Uh -oh. Mike, <laughs> Mike. Mike of is course. disturbed. <laughs> of course, Mike. No, I, I mean, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. It's fantastic. Oh, so, sorry, Mike. The best to record. Yes. To record uh, your question. Should I sing or talk? Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. Don't sing. <laughs> so, so when you're talking about Ray's work at the beginning, that work could be interpreted two ways. Absolutely, because yes. Because there may be more TH17 cells there, but we know that TH17 cells engineer the reg T regulatory escape. Exactly. And in fact, maintaining the TH1 cells which you had mentioned I interferon gamma is so important, may actually be what's driving this whole disease. Completely. I and, mean and that's actually supported by your IL-27, or Flugfelder's IL-27 work. <laughs> so I thought that was very interesting. I've always thought of Th17 cells at the ocular surface as the ones that are dealing with environmental stimuli, mild infections, etc. Yeah. And of course, Patients with ocular surface inflammation do have infection issues. They may need prophylactic antibiotics because their tears are not working, whatever. So yeah, I think we may be dealing with very different parallel uh, events or cross-cutting. Cross so I, I completely agree. And, and just one tiny little comment. The, the work about the, the, uh, the work we did way back with the dual TH1, TH2, those mice that did not get not show allergy because they were interfering gamma negative had very high levels of IgE systemically. Mm. So you remember we had the interfering gamma may serve as a gatekeeper of yeah, preventing yeah, those cells regulating. from actually coming yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Mike. Other question? So before the coffee break, I, I would like to really thank you again Absolutely because pu trying to put science inside extremely complex clinical diseases multifactorial either allergy or severe dry or chronic dry i would like also to thank particularly mike because i remember in the 90s mike belonging to allergan team tries to make science in the development of a new drug. The dr new drug was an immunosuppressant for dry, was cyclosporine. Mm -hmm. It's extremely rare because uh, right now, most of the major companies buy uh, a compound X somewhere in a small uh, uh, startup that has uh, developed the proof of concept. And then you never hear, hear about science at any moment. But at that moment, it was a time when some major companies were working on the scientific side. And it's a very, very important. Because when you are proposed to put uh, or to use a cyclosporine because it's uh, stinging a little bit less or the corneal staining is a little bit more something, or you, and you don't really understand why, it's, it's not really relevant. And this was extremely important. So thank you, Mike. The problem with the immunology is that uh, 
as far as you continue to move, uh, you start with an idea, you will start their hypothesis that uh, TH1 is associated to, to uh, dry, okay? And then you discover that TH17 is associated to dry, okay? Then you imagine and you know that uh, TH2 is associated to allergy, but you discover that uh, TH1, at least through interferon gamma, is also associated to chronic allergy. So it becomes effectively a nightmare to try to understand the, those kind of disease. Anyway, this raised a, a personal comment. You probably know that I was the promoter of the vicious cycle uh, theory. The fact that a series of biological events uh, progress together to, uh, from dry and uh, move to, at the end, to uh, either uh, to um, uh, even mo more severe dry. My opinion is that, in fact, those relatively pure mechanisms belong to the vicious cycle. This is an opinion, of course, it's not, uh, not uh, truly uh, proven. Anyway, I think that effectively, when we are in the chronic disease, we are in something where probably it's not only one system, but a combination of different systems that interact together. But it's probably rather fixed, which means that it's so difficult to go out, to get out the vicious cycle. But what I want to, to think for the future and right now is before entering the vicious cycle, before the mechanism uh, I stuck into uh, different biological events that are interaction in, in, in complex interaction and uh, more or less blocked. How can we, can the patient move to the vicious cycle? And it's what I call the spiral, the vicious spiral before the cycle. And the spiral can be extremely brutal after a, a complicated or more or less complicated surgery, for example, or an acute allergic challenge. Or it can be step by step by the accumulation of risk factors. And my comment is more on uh, the different risk factors around the, 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 the pure immunology that at some moment will be uh, switched on. Uh, how does it move. We, you, in your lecture, you have uh, suggested different cofactors. You have suggested, for example, that the uh, innate immunity may play a role. TLR, TLR, uh, TLR sorry. Toll-like receptors, for example, uh, complement, for example, uh, leukotrients that are independent from the uh, adaptive immunity. Uh, TLR uh, is, in my opinion, suggesting that the microbiotic challenge around the eye, but not only, may play a role. And effectively, Steve Fruchelder has shown that the microbiote locally is impaired, in balance. We don't know exactly because it's not due to a specific microorganism. It's a, a, an imbalance. But also the gut microbiote that also interact through different mediators, uh, and um, some uh, fatty acid that are uh, uh, released from the gut. Which means that probably this is also an interaction that at some moment will raise a level that will activate some kind of immunity that will be uh, able to co-activate this immunity. But it can also work both ways because some bacteria promote regulatory T cells to switch everything off. So just like the IL-27 story, some are good. So we don't want to switch all TLR off, just, just some, just the right ones. Excellent <laughs> comment that illustrates effectively the complexity mm -hmm. and the fact that it's not a question of a, a bad uh, microbe or a good microbe, it's a combination, the balance is positive or negative. Another example, you have shown that uh, re-challenging the animals makes the disease more severe. It, it, it's quite uh, easy to understand, but in fact, it showed that one acute challenge is not able to, to destroy everything and to cause the vicious cycle to, to, be, uh, to, 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 to start. Uh, probably because for the same reason as the microorganism may be positive or negative, inflammation is not always negative. An acute inflammation that may uh, repair and, and make the surface to recover after uh, a trauma or damage is positive. And we have now the, the concept of para-inflammation. That is a positive regulation of inflammation 
that is necessary for the tissue. And ophthalmologists have known this for years because they know that the soonest they can get anti-inflammatory drugs into the eye in a newly diagnosed patient, the better to arrest the inflammation. So again, to try and interrupt that vicious cycle. And uh, last point, you, you showed uh, another example of a cofactor, aging. Mm. Aging is probably due to the repetition of different challenges over over the life, but for animals, it's not probably not that. It may be the progressive impairment of the of protection of protective agents or elements or enzyme. I personally, um, I would suggest the oxidative stress, mm. for example, that is impaired. Or the regulation of oxidative stress is impaired uh, in aging uh, patient or and certainly animals. So probably the oxidative stress is also a cofactor. But oxidative stress means not only uh, spontaneous oxidation it's all by aging, but it's also the environmental challenge, the blue light, the violet uh, emissions, uh, the pollution. So you, we may also understand that those mechanisms are extremely important. And thank you again for, for explaining them, because we need that. But the cofactor may explain why some patient, and we have good example with Sjogren, we have Sjogren patient who will never develop extremely severe dry, and we have Sjogren patient that develop uh, from the, the very beginning of the disease extremely severe dry. So the threshold levels are probably important, and the cofactor also. And I would say that, that uh, beside this uh, extremely important science, it will be also important to to look on the side mm -hmm. like you you did yeah. with interferon gamma, that is a major information uh, in, in allergy. So thank you again. And we have some time for a coffee break, and we will uh, we will have also a very good session at ten. And uh, please take a moment.